Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Dimitri has been a uh, member of Friends of Andathos for longer than anyone can remember. And he's been a member of our executive committee, I know, since 1994. He's well known to most of us, particularly through his organization of our highly successful pilgrimage program. But Dimitri is a man of many parts. His publications range over such diverse fields as orthodoxy and ecology, and the mythology of Africa and Russia. But today he is wearing his musical hat. He is a musicologist with interests in the uh, medieval Christian chant traditions of the Greek, uh, Slavonic, and Latin churches. And he's published widely in these fields and continues to lecture in universities and theological institutions throughout Europe and Australia. And lately, I believe he's turned to studies in Byzantine hymnography. But his topic today is music as prayer. Thank you. Thank you. My daughter, Thalia, insisted that I wear this uh, tie, which is covered in treble clips. <laughs> she said it would make a nice atmosphere. <laughs> I said, yes, dear. <laughs> a very powerful statement from uh, Rowan Williams. Have you been a regular parishioner at St Paul's Cathedral in London between 1911 and 1934? You might have heard Dean Inch remark in one of his sermons that in the church uh, there is little to justify the notion that God enjoys nothing better than a serenade. Uh, Father Stephen made it myself. This is a statement by uh, Dean Inch, not C.S. Lewis. I've got something from C.S. Lewis already here. So a, a, a similar sentiment to the singing of hymns and psalms, be it choirs or congregations, was that of C.S. Lewis. Uh, in the late 1940s, he published an article entitled On Church Music. It's opening to assumptions are that first, nothing should be done or sung or said in church which does not aim directly or indirectly at glorifying God or edifying the people or both. And secondly, church services may have a cultural value but this is not what they exist for. Well, as for the um, Anglican, Ang Anglican hymns of his day, Lewis describes them as those fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. <laughs> uh, moreover, he abhorred the organ, which he described as one long. <laughs> Sixteen hundred years later, earlier, uh, earlier, we have an opinion on church song from Saint Pambo, an Egyptian desert father and a disciple of Andrew, Anthony the Great. Uh, this hermit is venerated alike by both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Abba Pambo lived in the Nitrian desert and was one of the many monks who rejected the performances of music that were customary in the large urban churches. Pambo and his followers claimed that singing tunes in the monastery church was detrimental to the soul. His views on music are quite, might I say, in tune with the attitudes of our two mid-20th century English sages. Let's hear the story of Pambo. It is reported that one day Abba Pambo sent his disciple from the monastery in the wilderness 
to Alexandria to sell some of the products of their manual labour. The disciple returned after 16 days, having spent his nights in the vestibule of the Cathedral of St. Mark, where he saw the ceremonies and heard the singing of hymns. Upon his uh, return to the monastery, Elder Pambo observed that the disciple was troubled by something. He asked for the reason. The young monk answered that he felt they wasted so many days in the desert, singing neither canons nor hymns such as he had heard at Alexandria. <coughs> to these complaints, the elder answered in despair that he saw the time coming when the monks would abandon their rigid discipline pronounced by the Holy Spirit and would give themselves over to songs, melodies. What kind of contrition, what kind of tears could result from singing, remarked the old man. When the monk stands in church or in his cell and raises his voice like an ox. <laughs> I think there's an ox in there. <laughs> no, we have the... Oh, it isn't? Okay. <laughs> we had an ox and we had lions before. Yeah. Right. The uh, monks did not emigrate into this desert in order to perform before God and to give themselves airs and to sing songs and to compose tunes and to shake their hands and move from one foot to another. <laughs> But we should offer our prayers to God in great fear and trembling, with tears and signs in reverence and in the spirit of contrition, with a moderate voice. Now I'm certain that Dean Inge and C.S. Lewis would heartily agree. All the same, it is reasonable to suppose that any early monastic opposition to music does not mean that the monks did not chant. In fact, what we observe instead with the early solitaries is the intoning of the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, from memory and for a substantial part of the day and night. Their rejection was of three things, worldly music, music exhibitionism, and the singing of non-scriptural refrains and plaintiffs. <coughs> the ultimate question here is this. What makes sacred music sacred? The words, the music, or both? Does the liturgical melody independently retain its sanctity, its capability to edify and glorify? Two fundamental issues of church music define its style. The first issue is, what is the correct manner of performance? And the second fundamental issue, what are the range and depth of the hymn writer's sentiments that the music may seek to express? Musicological debates on the historical evolution of church music has provoked as many difficulties as it has solved. Yet, all of these difficulties deal with, or write out of, what are perceived as fundamental character categories of church music. Namely, an appropriate textual and melodic repertory, and an appropriate compositional and performing style. The nature of that appropriateness and the authority to determine it are the primary issues that the historical evolution has sought to address. The evidence of history provides no answers to the question of what the characteristics and features of church music are. But academic discourse over the centuries has raised this question unremittingly, and certain recognisable patterns have sporadically emerged, though none has prevailed. Thus, 
Having reached this point of utter confusion, I thought it a sensible idea to consult a few Athenite monks, both those blessed by their abbots to sing and guide the choirs, as well as those who attend the services silently. The responses I received are not exclusively from Greek monks. They were also Athenites from France, Australia, Russia, and Brazil. What then is the meaning of music as prayer as understood on the holy mountain? Monk one, prayer without words of music alone is not prayer at all. And the introduction of music into the divine services, only for the sake of creating a mood, is simply a departure from orthodox monastic prayerfulness and piety. Indeed, from orthodoxy itself. Orthodoxy requires unconditionally conscientious prayer. It does not permit feebleness or indecision. Orthodox hymnody must unfailingly edify. Sounds from C.S. Lewis. Monk two. It is true that melody, when separated from the task of prayer, can evoke in us a certain disposition or mood, sadness, joy, solemnity. In these, however, our mind does not receive a single concrete image, not a definite idea which would morally edify. Only the words can do this. Therefore, he continues, all music, every hymn in the church, cannot, first of all, be other than oral. Music in itself, no matter how beautiful or elevated, cannot be prayer and cannot even unite with prayer if it does not grow organically from the text itself. Just as simple meditation can't be prayer, even though it is pious. True chant is inseparable, inseparable from the text. The melody subjects itself to the words, both in rhythm and melody. Monk three. In a home, sorry, in a homily, uh, St. John Chrysostom explains that the three dudes in the burning fiery furnace, quote, lifted up their voices and were saved. There is, I think, according to our understanding, something closely connected. On the one hand, between the physical element of singing, and on the other, the state of one's inner being. I mention this because most certainly, we are not like Christ in the perfection of his chanting after the Last Supper. Nor do we have the ability to praise as did the three youths in the burning fiery furnace. Rather, we cannot avoid expressing that which we have inside of us, that which we are, <clears throat> sinners, incomplete, imperfect, passionful, sometimes egoistic and vainglorious. Most certainly, then, our singing will have elements of the ego, passion, entertainment, and so forth. The mystery is that Christ accepts us as we are, trying and struggling to be better. <coughs> In the skeet of St. Basil on the Holy Mountain, continues Mark 3, it is said that for many decades, the Father's Tipicon included the following practice. After the priest's opening blessing, there was complete silence for four to six hours, during which the Fathers recited the Jesus Prayer. A bell was struck every hour to count the time. I can assure you that their services had much more spiritual harvest than anything we could try to muster in our grand chants and cryings out 
in any one of the tones or melodies or musical displays. Monk four. Music is the presence of the world transfigured. Song takes us up and away from the common world and moves us into the eighth day of the week. Monk five, the last. It seems to me that the purpose of singing today has become distorted from what it was in the beginning. For the singers, singing has become the aim of divine worship rather than its means or medium. Singing was introduced into the church as a means to help the congregation to concentrate on the words of the psalms and hymns. However, church singers nowadays, and not without the agreement of the faithful, use chanting as an occasion either to amuse themselves or to display their ability and vocal gifts, thus turning the services into an opera. Having heard this wisdom, we may well ask, why were the liturgical texts sung at all? Now the answer to this question is not unique to the Christian church. Nearly all faiths, and the Quakers are an exception, have built their services around the communal repetition <coughs> of sacred texts. Not silent repetition, but sounded repetition, through which the words of the prayers could be heard, mouthed, and absorbed by all. And for such sounded repetition, singing has seemed more natural than speaking. <coughs> Excuse me. Apart from the tediousness and ugliness of communal speaking, the rhythm of song, even when it is a comparatively a free rhythm, keeps everyone together and allows for audibility. And the melody of song assists the faithful to remember the words. The music of the monasteries helps to solemnize liturgical prayer and lends aesthetic substance to the religious sentiments of the monastic worshippers. During the early Middle Era, churches and monasteries were not thought of as a concert hall, and the plain chants that were performed there were never merely displayed for the pleasure of the community. The Catholicon was the Icos Kiriu, the house of the Lord, and its music was also the Lord's. It remained a distant mirror of the divine inspiration, perfect as earthly music might seem to be. It was but an echo of a more perfect music that would be heard in heaven. Contemporary pilgrims who have had the good fortune to hear Athenite choral singing live know at some intuitive level that something more than sound has touched them. There is a language of the human heart that is central to prayer, whether alone in the cell or with the worshipping community. But there is also music, melody, harmony, rhythm, pace, pitch. When the words and music combine, something remarkable is released into the stream of human life. As T.S. Eliot observed in the Four Quartets, music heard so deeply that you are the music while the music lasts. So the pilgrims at services on the mountain feel and come to inhabit the <coughs> praise and joy, the anguish and the sorrow. Sometimes it's in the ordered sound of faint 
tintillabulating bell tones or the clapping of the talata that pray for us. It may then dawn upon us that all this is prayer. At other times, the fusion of language and of ordered sounds in voices is our very act of praying in the listening and in the singing. Collectively, these events evoke and demonstrate how music is prayer. Well, I'll stop talking now and I'll, we'll have an example of uh, some music. I won't talk about that music right away, just for us to listen. I've chosen Psalm 102, verses 1 to 16. And this is the first antiphon at the liturgy, as sung on the holy mountain. Excuse the inevitable. <laughs> wait, wait for the problem to respond, yes. Of course, it were perfectly earlier today. <laughs>
sung is the story of a people at prayer, expressing in worship its particular cultural incarnation of the common faith. For the, for, for the forms of sung worship are the product of a religious culture and spirit, the unique way that a particular faith community perceives, lives, and celebrates its Christian life. Thus, Athenite plain chant, when sung solemnly, creates a sacred sound which complements the sacred space in which it is sung. While the melody is undoubtedly a means of making the sacred text audible, it does so in ways whereby the words sometimes seem almost secondary. The sacred sound is more important than the sense. Music is part of a ritual where most of what is done has symbolic significance, far removed from the Monday actions of everyday life. Chant, as prayer, contributes in its own special way to the quality of liturgical involvement. It is reasonable to say that these things have a stronger cumulative impact, difficult to describe in words. Music not only enhances text, but also can supply meaning where the text is missing. But music also provides depth of meaning and significance by its dual, temporal and timeless qualities. In his highly consummate book on Mount Athos, Graham Speak comments, the visual arts are the aspect of the Paleologian Renaissance that are most obvious to the Athenite pilgrim because they are all around him and strike the eye with an awesome impact. But equally striking for those who stop to listen is the impact on the ear during the services in the Catholicon. Also, Archbishop Alexander Galitsin, who in the 1970s in Oxford and under the aegis of Metropolitan Callistos, succeeded in receiving a doctorate. Archbishop Alexander would say, just succeeded. <laughs> Nevertheless, after his time here, he stayed for in, in the community at Simonogosha for two years. And his cogent insights on music and prayer at Simonopatra, when compared with the procedures at other houses, are typical of his criticism. But the monastery attracted me. Something obviously good was going on there. The first attract was entirely aesthetic. For one of Russian background, as I am, Church services simply have to be beautiful, and they were decidedly not beautiful in the 1970s on Athos. While the church edifices were gorgeous, with brass and precious metals, ancient frescoes, the services were all too often hours and hours of muttered curialisons and garbled sounds. Here at Simonovitra, though the building itself was <coughs> relatively unimpressive, the singing was crisply splendid and the rituals celebrated with elegance and economy, mercifully shorn of the interminable add-ons common in the other Athenite houses at that time. So why don't we listen to some crisply splendid chants? <laughs> Yeah. 
that was part of the great doxology uh, sung at the end of Matins. <coughs> Archbishop Alexander <coughs> uh, refers to rituals. What is meant by monastic ritual? Well, on the Holy Mountain, it is understood as a system of traditional actions to be carried out in the presence of what is sacred, following established rules. Such systems are active in all societies where the sacred has any meaning. They typically comprise action of symbolic significance, a special form of the language, and a special body of text to be recited or sung. The rituals attached to the Byzantine offices and Eucharistic celebrations are particularly rich in form and content, not least in their musical components. When trying to understand the ritual of which Athenite plain chant is but a part, it should be remembered that music is not ritual's only non verbal component. There are others. Architecture, icons, church furniture, the vestments of the clergy, the objects they hold and use, the incense, bells, as well as the wooden planks and suspended iron, which, when struck, percuss throughout the monastery, summoning the monastics to pray. Unlike other traditions of sacred music, there are certain values that monophonic <coughs> chant, plain chant, plain chant, embodies which are important aspects of church music. By monophonic plain chant, I mean song without harmony or instrumental accompaniment. Plain song does not expect you to come up, to come up with required emotions. In that it is repetitive, it assumes that the monk, the nun, or the pilgrim is prepared to take time. And this is significant. The monastics do not necessarily think that all hymn tunes have either a root note or a tonic, a fundamental key note, nor a climax. Nor do they expect resolution instantly or almost as well. Uniquely, monastic chant does something that the other styles don't. And this is important for understanding the role of liturgy as something that takes time, that requires a measure of attention, physical settling, patience. So, in one way, page Plain chant, especially a song on the mountain, can be intensely emo uh, emotional. But this is not because the purpose of melody is to arouse the emotions or sentiments. It's because the music so carries the narrative that one is present in it and with it. It does touch things unexpectedly. This is why pilgrims sometimes burst into tears when they hear the chant. And this is because there is not the list of musical techniques and the list of emotions that correlate, as you frequently encounter in harmonized choral church music. In harmonized music, deliberate dynamics and rather obvious techniques are at work. Crescendo. Diminuendo, forte, piano, presto, laudere, and so forth. Here we are meant to feel this or that emotion. I think that this is something that good sacred music does not do. Good Athenite sacred music, and not all of it is good, says, This is the stream into which I wish you. And I'm, I, sorry, I'll say it again. This is the stream into which you are invited to step. It may carry the pilgrim to some very disturbing emotional places, but that is because of the way it is going, because of its movement, its subject matter, its whole context. 
It's not because the composer has the competence to make one weep when he wants one to weep, or to make one rejoice when he wants one to rejoice. Rather, one is ideally exposed to the faith of the monk who composed the music. And as to the quality of the performance, well, this is judged whether or not it does something to one's soul. Let's turn now uh, to the Monastery of Simonopoulos again to hear its music as prayer. This uh, monastery, we have a picture of it here, just a picture. Um, this uh, was the first to provide new and melodious settings to the Psalms of David. And one example that I would like to pause on is a choral setting of Psalm 83, composed by one of the fathers, Father Gregory, at the monastery. Its opening lines are... Uh, slide text? Yes. It's the opening lines, or you can just read them. That's it. Yes, how and we will... Uh, just, I cannot find just the music. Music. Oh, you can't get the music. No, oh, it was supposed to be here, but so bad. It okay. disappeared. <laughs> so, try again. Can you restart again? So, how amiable are they? Play from here. Try to play from here. I cannot hear anything. Strange things happen. Anyway, I'll read it because uh, we're following this. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found the house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. And we'll try to get the first uh, two verses. Yes, possible. Uh, possible. Strange. So, apologies for that. I'm not ready to start. Is that? Yeah. Let's see that. If, if the previous one is working. No. Yes, but so bad. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. but we cannot uh, listen to that one, I'm afraid. I've chosen this psalm uh, because it relates to a poignant moment in the very early life of Simonopoulos community. An increase in tourism at the Matera, where they used to be, and an unhelpful new local hierarch forced Abbot Emilianos to search for another dwelling place, another tabernacle. Providence would eventually lead the monks to a new pinnacle, to a place on the rock of St. Simon the Athenite. Now, whether you read uh, music or not, I'd like to observe uh, the notes as images, what I call sonic iconography. Uh, I want you to observe the square brackets above the notes marked A, 
B and C. This is the best I can do, sorry about it. Oh. And you hear it in the back. When it's different place. Tapestry. 
the piece's expansive lines, mellifluous flow, and song-like contours make it more aria-like than conventional chant. The rhythms show the same tendency as the pitches, being gentle and rounded in their flow. The musical motifs A, B, and C are supple, never mechanically applied in the progression of the verses. The tunes rise in ever-expanding parabolas of sonic brilliance, while the Alleluia, here integrated into the psalm text, pulls us down to earthly realities. So here we have the frame, three A's, four B's, the cadence, and finally the Alleluia refrain. Simonopatra's music consist, consist, uh, um, constitutes tradition in the making. There is no slavish imitation of a forgotten or imagined past. Modern sensibilities are catered for since there are clear influences of Western harmonic theory made evident by the moving bass note and uh, evocative lyricism. Elder Emilianos clearly appreciates the salutary beauty in the text of the entire Psalter. This beauty, more in inter inter interior than exterior, harkens back to sentiments expressed by the 4th century fathers in particular. Together with them, he has placed value on musical execution. The addition of music makes the message of the psalms more alive and meaningful. And in the words of St. Basil and of St. John Chrysostom, it also makes words easier to remember. With respect to the inner beauty of music, Archimandrite Emilianos takes this line, a thought, one step further. Chant, he writes, touches the hearts of men. It reveals most expressively the meaning of the Psalter it deeply engraves spiritual values, our harvest uh, grace soothes and clarifies Christological and dogmatic meanings. The Psalter, through melody, opens up the gates of heaven. At the same time, the elder, together with C.S. Lewis, clearly understands that the Psalms are lyrics with all the formalities, the hyperboles, the emotional rather than logical connections, all of which are proper to lyric poetry. It is important to note that the elder identifies the spiritual riches that are to be gained not by reciting but by singing the psalms. As such, melody and words become prayer transfigured. It is significant okay, that there has been a noticeable resistance to Simonopatra's psalmody in many of the Athenite houses themselves by some professional musicians. Its opponents, regarding the music as simplistic, uh, even frivolous, echo the reactions of the early Desert Fathers to the new tuneful religious songs in the city churches. It is interesting, too, that the monastery's musical initiatives have been embraced much more enthusiastically in the urban contexts, both religious and secular. Elder Emilianos is a pace setter, both in his monastic outlook and in his sensitivity to pastoral concerns. For him, like Dostoevsky, the beauty that saves is a matter of confrontation, not conformity, of creative creativity, not custom. What of the future? Well, I think that on the Holy Mountain we shall observe a greater degree of choral singing as opposed to soloistic virtuosity, though the latter will not disappear entirely for some time. Athenite music is also undergoing an observable commercialization. Some monasteries have lately been negotiating with the music industry. On the other hand, there has been a recent tendency to examine the old music manuscripts in order to rediscover earlier traditions and vocal practices. Western musical tendencies, though perhaps never acknowledged as such, 
may continue to blend in with the chant. The Athenite musical tradition has adapted over the centuries to changing cultural tastes and conditions. This identifies it as an art that is living and accommodating. Because of its prestige, not only the spiritual message of Athos, but also its artistic creations will constitute a leading force for trends well beyond its own territory. Simonopatra's emphasis on psalm singing as opposed to dry reading and the progressive style of the music have much to say about Father Gregory the composer, the musical ability of the monastery's choirs, the spiritual milieu within which the community lives out its life of worship, and the elder Emilianos's perception of music as prayer. Thank you. will do something different. So it will be characteristic of its way of doing it. And that one will do it that way. But there would be a common ground. But I can't be more... Except for the non-Greek speaking. Um, the non-Greek speaking have different styles. Oh, the non-Greek. Do you say the non-Greek? No. 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 Yes, but that's also a point to make. The, the non-Greek uh, monasteries clearly have their own particular styles and traditions, and some of those involve harmonised music. I just wanted to ask, what do you think about the Slavonic singing, chanting? <laughs> like Slavonic chanting starts in 1100 <laughs> and ends now. Uh, so which part of, or which aspect? Uh, uh, melody? I uh, wouldn't say words, because uh, Slavonic Different. The, well, if we're, these, these are the melodies are quite characteristic, but when it comes to Slavonic, we have different things. So how do we find them? So you're talking about the, in like, the present time, yes, yes. not in the historical time. No, I don't know much of okay. um, there are some composers that are very good, and uh, if and if, I don't think that harmonised music is wrong, but it can be controlled but so can the other style as well. So I do like Kostalski, for I think he is a very fine composer. I, 
don't know very much about Polish music, but it's much the same, I suppose. Yeah. But I think uh, there's a <clears throat> there's a movement away from 19th century um, romantic style music, and much more new music is coming up. Even um, even Metropolitan Hilarion is composing pieces for the for the church. Anyone else? You haven't said anything about instrumental music, of course, but uh, in America, for example, in Finland, I think, the organ is used. Um, is this something you would regard as uh, unattractive or uncanonical? There's, there are no canons about the church, to my knowledge. Um, and there's no canon saying you can't have a musical instrument in the church. Uh, the reason is it never happened. So there was no reason. <laughs> so, but uh, it's, it's a question of taste. I think it's bad taste uh, to play uh, an organ in, uh, in, in a server that is made for congregation actually singing. Um, what, what is the function of the organ? actually. Uh, the themes that people sing in the church, the ones that sing in um, congregations, they're simple tunes. They don't need uh, strength. One loud roar. <laughs> mm. Any more? Uh, yes, Alan. Um, difficult question to ask, uh, Dimitri. Thank you. Because I'm not a musicologist like you. I know a little bit about music. Um, so, Obviously, the traditional Byzantine Greek singing uh, was not based on the Western classical diatonic style, True. diatonic scale. Um, to what extent do you think the younger generation of monks uh, will lose the tradition of singing in the correct Byzantine tonal scale, where you have microtones, which we don't have in, in Western music? Is that happening? I don't know. Um, Macrotones are recent. Yes. They're recent. They're not old. Right. Okay. So macrotones, you don't start seeing those in manuscripts uh, before um, up yes up to 16th century. Really. You wouldn't have yeah. that. Uh, and even the treatises on musical theory right. don't talk about them at all. Really? They don't talk about the ison either. No. By the way. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's it's lots that you could teach me that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that before I asked the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, am I right in thinking that the, in the Orthodox Church, the choir was all of the whole congregation? And at what point did it changed to being the choir and then the Yes, the big change came with the invention of a, um, new, uh, uh, of writing in, with notes. There were no notes before the ninth century. The, choirs were, the choir was the congregation, but there was a leader, then, and there was a group that had to do the particular <coughs> things that weren't sung every week. Uh, but um, over the years, everyone will be singing. Once you get n notation, you get professionalization. People become pro professionals. Mm -hmm. And then they do it their way. And my way is the right way, and your way is the wrong way. Because, look, that book has it this way. But when you don't have a notation, you just gradually change as the culture tells you. Obviously, the music of the fourth century would be nothing like the music of the 8th century without notes. But once you get notes, then you become a professional. I'm doing it the right way, you're doing it. There are fights. There are fights. Not physical. Not <laughs> can, can you say anything about the Georgian tradition? Uh, there is the Georgian monastery, and 
this is such a wonderful tradition and so different and Pythagorean scale and things I don't really know about. Can you comment on the superb Georgian tradition which seems to spring from the people in the fields and no notation? No, we we no learned notation. it just orally. Quite right. Uh, no, I don't know very much at all about it, but I'd love to hear it and I even sing it. Uh, but I don't know anything of its history or its development. But something that I'd like to know. Mm. But there are no manuscripts. Mm. And I would like to know if there is a difference. In, so in the morning sessions we were discussing there was a difference between um, <coughs> the poem and the verse. So is there a difference between singing and chanting? Mm. You could say that chanting is for religious music, but not only, but essentially. Um, and it's always, and chanting is always a single line of music, not many voices singing together. I've always loved the, um, the take of uh, ancient chants of Rome. Of my uh, superiors in Andropolis. So, two questions about that. How sure can we be that this is a fully accurate rendition? And secondly, how long did that type of use of machines in combination of Byzantine and Roman charm last for? There's a very good lapse of the time when a lot of the popes are actually uh, Byzantine or Syrian. Yes, I'm not sure of the dates um, altogether, but it's true that um, in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Romans, the Latins, went over to Constantinople, they uh, listened to the music and took it back, and also left things. Uh, and that's a normal procession uh, thing to, to do, it's quite natural. Uh, but uh, get the same, same thing happened um, with um, about the 8th century, everything was standardised in Rome, and the local styles were banned. They're coming to life only in the last century. But I don't know very much more about that, because it's not written. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether this is um, going beyond the bounds of the conference and uh, uh, this particular topic. Not going, it's not going beyond the bounds of music, but one of the ways that orthodoxy has become very much more appreciated by people in the West is the music of particular composers, orthodox composers, Stravinsky originally, then Rachmaninoff, and John Taverner most recently. Now, of course, there's a huge gap between those composers and uh, the liturgical music of Mount Athos, but are they all, as it were, taboo composers, or is there some kind of discussion within orthodoxy on so-called modern music and traditional liturgical music? You've spoken essentially about Russian composers. I suppose so, yes. Uh, there, I don't really know of any Greek composers no. who have done a liturgy. Mm. Some Latvian composers, I believe. Mm. But they would have done it in the Russian style. Okay. Uh, and and that's not taboo at all. Uh, you've got Stravinsky's liturgy, you've got Tchaikovsky's yes. liturgy, mm. Rachmaninoff, very, very popular. Uh, no, if, if you want to do it, you can do it. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to ask, um, during Advent on the Holy Mountain, are there carols sung? Ah, <laughs> it would be a decision made by the church, uh, uh, by the monastery. I was there one time uh, at Christmas and uh, I was at Simonoptera, for example, and 15 Russian boys came up and sang carols. Uh, so it's, it was that, that's the relationship, but it wouldn't be standardized by any means. Well, I think maybe <clears throat> it's time we put things to a close. We have great expectations of first business now, of course, but uh, let us thank Dimitri once more for his fascinating. <laughs> Thank you.